and Jacob. Okay. So, um, do you want me to share this as a story, or are you just guys? Just like you did before. Just like you did before. I uh, really, yeah, that was perfect. Okay. All right. So, I just want before I start. So, how many of you um, were not born in this country? One, two, two. Only two were not born in this country. Okay. How many of you? How many of you have family members? Like your mom and your dad, they were not born in this country. Okay? And how many of you have ancestors, like grandparents, that were not born in this country? So that brings us back to everyone, right? And that's pretty much which the direction I wanted to go. That basically, um, we consist of um, the makeup of what they call the melting pot. Have, have you guys ever heard that term before? Uh, okay, and basically um, we have um, a variation of cultures that came together and formed what we know now as our beautiful country. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and, and the reason why I wanted to do that um, with you guys and, and I, I originally did it with the teachers and um, just just this is the result that we got from the questions that I asked you. How many of you were born here? How many of you had parents that were I mean, born elsewhere? And how many of you had grandparents that were born elsewhere? I wanted to share that because I wanted to make that connection with the teachers um, that teach every single one of you. And, and, and so here we have like three or four that were born out of the country and then the majority of the class were born here. But when you, when you are born in another country and you come to this country, um, particularly as a um, teenager or um, ages 10 or older, it makes it very difficult for that person to adjust to a culture that they've never had any experience of. It makes it very diff difficult for a person to be able to communicate, be able to um, make friends, um, it makes it very difficult for that person to be able to understand in class, um, to be able to be successful in school, and to be able to have the preparation that it, that, that it takes for them to be successful later in life, right? Because think about it, if you don't have the communication skills and you can't communicate with someone, then how are you going to feel having come to a country where before you could communicate and you did have friends that you grew up with and you could express yourself and come into a place where you can't, okay? So that's a very difficult thing to do. And so I shared that story, my story with the teachers and I asked the teachers to share their story with me because I wanted to know a little bit more about them and I wanted them to learn a little bit about you. So I believe that through your language arts class, you guys got a chance to write about, to write a story, right? And, and um, that should have happened through every language art class where you, you wrote about yourself and you wrote about maybe a, a difficult time in your life and, and some of the challenges that you've had to overcome, right? Okay. Well, if you didn't get to do that, and for those, so those of you that did, I, I thank you for that. So let me tell you, um, I shared my story with the teachers. I asked my teachers to share my, the story with, with me, okay? And I have, I, there was a good rate of that turned in stories to me, not, not all of them. Um, and, and what I did with your stories is that every assistant principal by grade level has your story in a binder. So that gives us the opportunity to look into a little bit more about you in case we have to help you in a certain way or not. We have your information, we can read about it and get to know you on a, in, on a personal level to a certain degree so that we can help you and, and, and build connections. Because this whole thing is about building connections. So I, um, I came to this country when I was 10 years old, um, turning 11 years old. Um, I was born in Havana, Cuba, and um, my family and my family and I um, had the opportunity to come. Um, originally, 
my family was making my family here in the United States, my grandmother and my grandfather and my uncle were making plans for me and my family to come through Spain. We were gonna go through another country, live there for a year, and then after that year we would get the opportunity to come to America, but they would have to support us and pay for everything that we needed that whole year while we were at Spain. So that, that, that costs a lot of money. Imagine having to support another family overseas, right? And so in 1980, um, Fidel Castro decided that he was going to open up um, the waters, basically telling the people that if they wanted to let, leave Cuba, they could, they could go ahead and do so. So during that time, um, all of the Cuban Americans that were here already, that left maybe during the, the 50s, right? That came or already established here in the United States, they had families that were over in Cuba, and those people, the people that could afford to, or the people that had means to, um, got boats and went over to Cuba to pick up their relatives. Now, um, that was a lot of people that Fidel Castro was not expecting for that to happen. And so my uncle, um, who at the time um, worked for Honeywell, and he had a great position for Honeywell, decided that he was just gonna go and just do whatever it took to get his family, his sister, which is my mother, and, and, and my mom's family, which includes me, my dad, and my sister, over to America. So he um, was able to uh, join some other friends and other strangers, and together they purchased a boat, and he left his family, he left his good job, and he just took the risk in wanting to go get us from Cuba. So he got on a boat, went all the way to Cuba, and it wasn't a very big boat, went all the way to Cuba, and um, started waiting because at that time there were so many boats that went to pick up people from Cuba that it was just crazy. The whole bay was filled with boats. I never got to see that, but could you imagine? There were over 120,000 Cubans that came during that summer from Cuba to America. So um, he had to do what he, he had, he went ahead and, and did what he had to do. He made it to Cuba and then Fidel Castro knowing that um, there were so many people that were leaving, he, he didn't expect that. So at that time, um, they, he decided that he was, instead of letting the family members leave with, um, with the family that went to get them, he was thinking that maybe he could open up his jails and he allowed bad people to leave Cuba instead of the people that originally were going to be claimed, such as families, right? And so, um, people were upset, uh, they turned around and they left empty without any, anyone on their boat. Some people were able to make deals. Fortunately for me, uh, my uncle uh, worked out something, he was a businessman, and he worked out a deal that we were able to come. Now, back then, um, when you were trying to leave the country, you were, you were considered a traitor because Cuba was and is a communist country, and now there, there, there are some changes that are happening, but it's still a communist country. So back then, if you were considered a traitor, the people didn't like that. So what they would do was, when you were getting ready to leave, and they knew that you were leaving, they would wait outside of your house, and they would throw rocks at you, and throw eggs at you, and hit you with sticks, and beat you because they were angry that you were betraying their country and betraying Fidel Castro. And you guys know, do you guys know who Fidel Castro is? Okay, all right. So, um, so you will be betraying their country. So my uncle, um, smart man that he, that he is, um, gave us a forewarning and told us that we had to leave the day before we got the message to leave. We had to leave the night before so that we could not get beaten. So we did. And then, sure thing, the next day, because we were able to, we were able to call my house back the next day. My my aunt that stayed behind, my family that stayed behind at the house where we lived, told us that there were people waiting outside. 
our house and throwing eggs and rocks and trying to do uh, mean things and, and ready for us to come out, but we had already left. So I, um, we went to this special place where all the, all the people leaving Cuba would go to and they held you there on, on, on like a, a, a camp center, right? And it's not like a camp that you go for summer, it's like it was just like a, a immigration camp center where they had tents and they had um, um, beds, right? And, and that's where you would stay and some people didn't, didn't have beds, some people had to sleep on the floor and so forth and so forth and sometimes people didn't even get to leave there. Some people never even got a chance to leave Cuba. Fortunately for me and my family, we got to leave um, on the last boat that left Cuba. And that boat um, was called the Red Diamond. And the Red Diamond, uh, you'll probably be able to Google that. I'm sure you can go on, 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 on Google, because I have. And I didn't know the name of the ship until I was older. And um, I was telling my story like this later on when I had already grown up. And I was telling my story to teachers, just like I'm telling my story now. And in the midst of my story, a gentleman says, you were on the Red Diamond. And all of the hairs on my arm stood up. And I was like, how do you know? And he tells me that he was the captain of the United States Coast Guard that was sent out to my ship to rescue us. Now, let me just fill you in on how that happened. We left on the last ship. It was over capacity. There was over 500 people on it. Um, the seas that summer were, were the worst seas ever. Um, I remember sitting on the edge of the boat all the way at the top where the captain steers with my mom and my sister next to me. And I remember the waves going over the ship. And I remember being able to see other little boats, smaller than ours, sinking and dying. Um, and I remember all those thoughts. And I grew up and I came to this country and I went to a school where I didn't speak the language and I couldn't understand a thing. And kids asked me to do things that were not right and I got in trouble for them. And um, I remember not being, I remember being very frustrated and not being able to do the things that you guys can speaking the language. So as I grew up, I prepared myself and I had an aunt who was a teacher and she helped me to learn English and she helped me to write and she helped me to um, develop the skills that I need, uh, needed to, to be successful. And I grew up, and I it was very it was very struggling. My parents didn't make a lot of money, but they I had a good family. And I grew up, and I went to a school that um, I really didn't want to go. But my parents my parents didn't have any direction as to where I would go because we had just come to this country. We didn't know all the resources. We didn't know about colleges. We didn't know about any of those things. So they felt that the best thing that I could do was to be an electrician. So they sent me to a school that I really didn't want to go to. So I figured out how to get away from that school. And the only thing I could do to get out of that school was to fail, because I wanted to go where my friends were. <coughs> so I failed, and I got kicked out of that school. And I thought I was being successful at what I was trying to do, but at the end, I was really hurting myself. But I got what I want. I wanted to go to high school with my friends just like you would want to go to high school with your friends. So when I got to high school, I, I met one person, and I'm talking to you about this because what I wanted to do with my teachers this summer was to make connections with every single kid and for them to be able to relate to you and understand that you're, you have needs and you may have different needs with each other, but 
we have to make connections with every kid regarding regardless of what where you came from, regardless of what you look you look like, regardless of what language you speak. I want my teachers to be able to relate to every single kid. So I had a wrestling coach that um, asked me to wrestle, and that one person really took my hand and 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 really gave me the support and the strength that I needed to overcome all of my mad, bad grades because then I was able to be successful and I started liking sports and I started wrestling and I started going to day school, night school, summer school, every school that you could possibly could think of. I did it because I wanted to be I wanted to be on that wrestling team. So, I grew up, I graduated, had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and then all of a sudden, I started being an assistant wrestling coach at a high school. And that later turned into being there one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, it turned out to be me and an assistant wrestling coach. And I loved it. And I fell in love with working with kids, and I fell in love with the sport, and I, it gave me a purpose and an opportunity. I became a teacher. And still didn't really think much about where I came from or how I got here because I was able to push back in my thoughts about those bad experiences that I had. And so I became a teacher and I started doing my thing and then it led me to that class that I was explaining to you about. And I was able to connect with that man who later explained to me the reasons why he was there on that summer of 1980 while I was on the ship with my family. Now, that guy was sent there for a reason. And I didn't later recognize what that reason was until I made another connection later on when I became a principal of the school. Where I was kind of talking to a person that works here and I was sharing how I got here. And he said, oh my God, Mr. Diaz, there is a book there is a book that explains exactly your story. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, yes, it's called Tomorrow. Finding Tomorrow is the title of the book. I go, what are you talking about? So he brings me this book and he shows me the picture of the red diamond of the boat that I came on. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, how did you get this? Where? What are you talking about? And he explains to me that another person just like me, who also came on that boat along with me, decided that she was gonna write her story and she was gonna share her story by even going to more depth into the story that what I was able to. And she wrote the story from her, from her being a little girl all the way to coming from Cuba. And she explains in that story, and I remember that story very well because I lived it. And I was on that boat. We were ready, ready to capsize. I remember that a helicopter came to us, and there was a lady who was pregnant, and she was taken off the ship with helicopter. But then we had other ships that were next to us, American Coast Guard ships. I was too little. I was like, like a little like overwhelmed with everything that was going on at the time. But I remember that these ships were around us. Well, in the story she tells us, that the captain of the ship was trying to call the Coast Guard in the United States and he was asking for help because we were getting ready to capsize. We were getting ready to sink. We were gonna go under. I had innocent people. Well, the Coast Guard person who was receiving the information from the captain of the ship via the radio, that person here in the States decides that he needs to find out what they were gonna do because we were the last ship that left Cuba and then during the time that we left, the borders were already closed and so we were not allowed to come into the United States. So basically we would be crossing borders without permission and then at that point, like that's not a good thing to do, right? And so the Coast Guard finds out, the Coast Guard person that was on the radio with it finds out that the, that gentleman was asked to relay back to the Coast Guard ships that were next to us to sink us because we were not allowed to come into America and just to just completely sink us out there in the middle of the, of the middle of the ocean. That information I didn't find out until I read the book 
and found out, found out about it. But think about it, you're a 10-year-old kid. Imagine where my life would have ended if that would have really happened to us because one person had the power to say yes or no. Well, you obviously know that they didn't sink us because the person who was taking the commands from Washington said, the only way I'm gonna do this because there's innocent kids and innocent people on that boat, the only way I'm gonna do this is that if you give me the power in writing to do so, and unless it's in writing, I'm not gonna do that. And minutes later, the, the communication coming back from Washington was that, it said, let him in. And I've kind of jumped around in my story because I wanted to explain to you what it was for me to be a kid. Um, it, was a, it was a very big struggle coming here. And, um, and, and luckily for me and luckily for many people that came on that ship um, were, were, were successful. I knew about the Red Diamond only because a friend of mine who I went to high school with and wrestled with and also became a teacher with um, kind of Googled that information for me because I never Googled it or even just even looked into it. I just, I, it was so traumatic for me that I didn't even want to go back and look at it. But he Googled the picture for me and when he Googled the picture for me, I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. I was on this ship and, and when, you're, when, you're, when it's a part of your life that really is so significant um, and it impacts you so, so deeply, um, you kind of like get overwhelmed with it. And um, I called because I wanted to get a picture of that, a printout of that picture of that boat. And uh, I was trying to get a digital picture and it wouldn't allow me, the, the computer wouldn't allow me to do it. So I called information and I called the lady and I said, hey listen, I want to be able to print this picture. Well, how do I go about doing that? Well, this lady was in the Museum of Miami for all the refugees that come to America. And she tells me, why do you want this picture? And I said, well, because I was a little boy on, this pic on, the, on, on that ship. Well, it ends up being that that ship that I came on was such a big story during the summer of 1980 that it made, it made the news all over. Of course, the news was not like it is today that, you know, every news reporter, you get something bad happens and everybody's there. But the, um, the lady says that the person who took the picture actually won a Pulitzer Award for taking the picture of the ship coming into the bay with the Coast Guard ship that was next to me, right next to it, and you see people standing around the ship. I looked for me, I didn't see me, but I was on that ship. And so she tells me, she goes, why do you want this? I said, well, I was on the ship. I was part of that. And she says, oh my God, I have never spoken to anyone that I had anything to do with that ship. And I said, but I tell you what, I even have something else. And I will bring it tomorrow. I forgot it today, but I will bring it tomorrow. I still have the shirt that I wore when I came from Cuba at 10 years old. I still have the same shirt that I wore on that day that it wasn't like you could just go to Walmart or you can go to Target or you can go to the mall and buy. In Cuba, you didn't have that. My aunt actually made this shirt for me. And, uh, and, I, and I wanted to bring the shirt, but I, I, I forgot and I, I apologize to Mr. Cool, but I'll bring it tomorrow um, so that I could share with you um, the size that I was when I came and so that I could share with you the reason why I'm so passionate about this school is because for the majority of our kids, um, they're kind of going through the same things that I went through when I was a kid coming to a country that didn't speak the language. And that is why I'm so passionate about being the principal at the school. Because I know that it's not easy. I know that there are kids here that are going to have many struggles later in life. And that is why it is so important to have an education and prepare yourself for life, regardless whether you were born in this country or not, regardless whether your, your, even your ancestors were born in this country, regardless of any of that, the point that I'm trying to make is that you guys need to know how to write, you need to know how to read, you need to know your math, you need to be able to be successful, you need to work hard at what you do so that you could be something, something one day in the future, something much bigger than me and something much bigger than what you can imagine 
that you can be. And I have no doubts that if you guys do that and prepare yourselves for the, for the life ahead of you, that you'll be able to be successful. So was it easy for me? No. Is it gonna be easy for you? Maybe, maybe not. It all comes down to how much you prepare yourself for tomorrow. And think of it one way. You can play today, right? You can play today and have to work really hard tomorrow. Or you can work hard today, but then tomorrow you can play even harder. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Right? If you really think about it, if you really work hard now and prepare yourself for life tomorrow, when you get there, you'll be able to play and do anything that you want. But if you decide that you're gonna take your youth and you're gonna to play today and waste your time and not prepare yourself for the tomorrow, I promise you that the tomorrow will not be as fun as the playing that you're doing today. Because the responsibilities kick in and, and, and life can be very difficult if you're not prepared for it. So, um, that is my story. And um, maybe it impacted you, maybe it didn't. But just understand that just like, just like you and your friends that you have here at the school, some of them are struggling and some of them are, have to work even harder than you do. Uh, but just encourage them and, and help them and understand that they're not, they're not as perfect as you are because, not because they're not perfect, but because they don't know the language. And that's something very hard to do. And it takes many years to be able to really acknowledge and comprehend and feel in a place, feel comfortable enough so that you can express yourself, not only verbally, but in writing and in reading. And, um, and, and many kids get very shy and, and, and they don't like to speak because they think they have an accent and they're embarrassed, but it's, it's understanding. So you have to encourage your friends, hey, don't be shy, try to speak English, try it. Don't worry about your accent, it's okay. Because you're helping them and you're, and you're, and you're helping them to be more positive and you're helping them to be more confident in speaking the language. And, um, and you're, doing, and you're, and you're being, doing a good thing. Um, so, um, any questions for me? Yes. Do you have the book? In your yes, book? I do. I do have the book, and I and they have it in Spanish and in English. I could, <laughs> I could, I could bring you, I could bring you the book if you want to read it. Sure. Um, I could bring you the book. Uh, yes. They, they did take the pregnant lady out. And actually the men on the boat were all the way on the bottom of the cellar of the boat. So only the women and kids were on the top. So when that lady said that, that when that lady was having given birth, they said, there's a lady up here giving birth. And my dad said, that's, that's my wife. It really wasn't his wife, but he was so desperate to be with his family that he said it was him and he was actually able to come to the top and be with us um, for the rest of the trip. So. It was a pretty big. It was a pretty big ship. Um, we could Google it and I could, and I could show you what it looked like. Yes. Um, my, in a fifth grade class, my teacher she read us a book called Ninety Miles to Havana. Yes. Oh and yeah. It was about this kid who came from Cuba and he had to stay. He came from Havana and he had to stay in that same camp that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then he was my yes. Connection. Real good connection. Yeah, that's that's a good book. My, I, I never read it um, because I lived it, but um, <laughs> my daughter read the book, um, read 90 Miles to Havana, Havana and uh, she read that book in, 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 I think, in middle school, when she was going to middle school. We have copies of it here in the library if you want to check it out. Any more questions? <laughs> well, because the lady was giving birth, but, but actually the boats were there because we were so top heavy. There were so many people and the waves were so big that the boat was getting ready to capsize, right? And if we would have flipped over and capsized, we would have all drowned. So there were, the boats were there to take people off our ship so that our weight, or the weight of the ship could, could, could lessen. And so that's, that's why they were there. So originally, 
originally they were there to not allow us to come through. And you have to understand that just like that incident happened or could have happened, there are a lot of boats and there are a lot of people that have tried to leave Cuba to make it to the United States because they want a better opportunity for them and for their kids. And, and, and they, they take a risk and they build these homemade rafts. They made these homemade rafts and then they try to go with the currents and try to make it to this country. And most of the time, they don't make it because either a storm or they don't have, they, they get lost at sea, they don't have any food or they get eaten by sharks. Um, you know, it, it, it's very dangerous to do that because I remember being a little kid and my parents, before my, my grandparents were trying to do paperwork to get us through Spain, I remember being a little kid, even smaller than you, because of course I was smaller than you, but I remember them going to look for, my dad looking for boats with his friend so that we could leave in the middle of the night so that the Cuban government wouldn't catch us and actually escape from Cuba uh, and then try to come to America. And I remember looking at that little boat and I was like, gee, that's not, not, gonna, that's not a good idea. Um, but with, what they would do is that if the, if the government back then found you trying to leave Cuba, they would shoot you down and you would you would die at sea. Nobody would know. I'm sure that you know that there are, there are uh, an enormous amount of people that have died in that 90 mile stretch between Havana and Key West. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of happy sharks because they they feed off of that. And many people die um, on that stretch. Yes. Um, when my mom when my mom was coming to Tampa. Um, it was her, my brother, who, who was 10, and my mom was pregnant with my second brother and um, my dad, and they were trying to get over here and print everything they could, and someone told them that if they put their names in a watermelon and throw it out to sea, that they would go to Tampa or something for the, in the next year or so, and then when they threw the uh, watermelons into the ocean, he just came back, came back and grabbed them and just left. Wait, who came back? Because um, someone told them that if they threw a watermelon with all their names in it, that they would um, go to Tampa and go... Yeah, I got that back. part. So what happened after that? When they threw it, he just came back and he like came and like took all of them. Oh. Who was he? I don't know. Someone. Some guy. And where did they take him to? He took him home and ate him. They ate the watermelon? So... Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of people that have different beliefs, and and they try anything. When you're in desperation mode and you're trying to leave a country where you can't feed your kids and and you don't see any any future, and you don't see working opportunities, and you're struggling, and you and you want you you're a parent. You want to 